Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Before we start with the main stories, an update from yesterday's video. Yesterday, we discussed a story published by Hong Kong-based South China Morning Post, reporting that Beijing had invited the leaders of Germany, France, Italy, and Spain for an official visit after the 20th Party Congress. Since then, China's foreign ministry has called the report fake news. But the South China Morning Post maintains the accuracy of the report, writing again today: "Quote, asked about the Chinese foreign ministry's denial, the well-placed source confirmed that the EU member states had been approached about a potential visit in November, and were currently deliberating how to deal with the issue." End quote. We should note, while we're speaking of the South China Morning Post, that the outlet is owned by Jack Ma's Ali Baba Group. Now let's move into the main stories, and let's start with the big news in U.S.-China relations from the last 24 hours. U.S. Speaker of the House of Representatives Nancy Pelosi plans to visit Taiwan next month in a show of support for Taipei, to use the words of some U.S. media outlets. We remember that the 82-year-old Democrat cancelled her visit in April, citing COVID. Now it's being reported that she plans on taking a delegation to Taiwan in August. The delegation will also visit Japan, Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia, according to reports. If the trip goes ahead, then it will be one of the highest level visits from a sitting U.S. lawmaker in decades, likely provoking a strong reaction from Beijing. Indeed, in April, China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi expressed that a Pelosi visit would represent a quote malicious provocation. End quote. Some U.S.-based China analysts are warning that the trip could spark more than just a rhetorical response from Beijing too, with Washington-based veteran China analyst Bill Bishop discussing a possible August Taiwan crisis today. Quote. We can expect lots of angry statements between now and her possible trip, but I would not underestimate the risk of seeing a response that goes beyond rhetoric from the PRC side, as she and others really do seem to be getting really angry about what they see as U.S. salami slicing of its One China policy. Something I think has been reflected in what, to me, sound like increasingly shrill warnings about Taiwan over the last few months. I am not sure we fully appreciate what a 2022 version of a Taiwan Straits crisis would look like, or how markets, investors, and business might react. But I expect a strong PRC reaction to a Taiwan trip would add more pressure to increased hedging around, if not decoupling, from the PRC. End quote. And quote. China has become convinced that Congress and the executive branch are colluding to contain its rise. Since Speaker Pelosi is a Democrat and from the same party as President Biden, her trip is interpreted as part of a strategy of using Taiwan as a card against China and providing official support for Taiwan independence. End quote. The original story of the trip was broken by UK-based Japanese-owned Financial Times, which writes today that three people familiar with the situation said the White House had expressed concern about the trip. Aware that the timing is sensitive for China because it will come in the same month as the August 1st anniversary of the founding of the People's Liberation Army, and of course the party will hold its 20th Congress later this year. Meanwhile, former U.S. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper, speaking to Taiwan's leader Tsai Ing-wen this week, expressed that the U.S. should move from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity on cross-strait affairs and re-examine its One China policy. Saying, quote, "It is my personal view that the One China policy has outlived its usefulness, and it is time to move away from strategic ambiguity." End quote. In response to the news about the Pelosi visit, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian expressed that the trip will quote, "have a serious negative impact on the political foundation of the China-U.S. relationship, and send a gravely wrong signal to Taiwan independence separatist forces." End quote. The same day, a spokesperson for the Taiwan Affairs Office of the People's Republic of China State Council expressed that the trip is quote nothing more than an attempt to obstruct China's reunification process. End quote. 
Some in Chinese state media have advocated much more reckless PRC responses, with the state-run Global Times writing that the People's Liberation Army should establish a no-fly zone over Taiwan, implying that a People's Liberation Army Air Force aircraft should shoot down a plane carrying a high-level US delegation of lawmakers, an act which would certainly start a war. Such a move seems very unlikely, however. As an alternative, the writer of the same article also suggested that, quote, PLA warplanes could escort Pelosi's plane at an appropriate distance, enter the island at the same time as she does, skim over her landing site, and then fly over the island and return to the Chinese mainland, end quote. We remember back in June, during the Shangri-La Forum in Singapore, PRC Defense Minister Wei Fenghe warned that the PLA would go to war over Taiwan. Hey guys, if you're enjoying this episode of China Update, don't forget to hit the like button. And for anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help me keep China Update financially sustainable, it's just me making these every day, then Patreon and buy me a coffee links are in the description below. Thank you everybody, everybody for the ongoing support. Now let's have a quick update with the outbreak and lockdown situation before we move on to the economy and housing crisis updates. Outbreaks are slowly creeping up in numbers again this week. More than 20 provincial level regions in the mainland have reported locally transmitted COVID-19 cases this week, with total daily numbers increasing too. As we discussed in yesterday's video, according to Nomura Holdings Limited, a Japanese investment bank, well over 250 million people and almost one-fifth of the economy is now affected by COVID restrictions of some kind. Now, keep in mind, this does not mean 250 million people are under lockdown. This means that people are in regions or sub-regions that have some form of restriction or lockdown in place, thus having some form of disruptive effect on the lives and businesses of these people. Yesterday, Tuesday, China's National Health Commission reported 699 official new local infections, including cases in the capital. About a third were in the western province of Gansu. Shanghai reported 19 new asymptomatic local cases yesterday, up from 14 the day before, while local symptomatic cases were 4, up from 3 the day before. We remember that while these seem like tiny numbers of cases, due to zero COVID policy, even a small number of cases can result in large-scale policy responses from citywide mass testing to shutting down businesses to, in extreme cases, full lockdowns. Chinese epidemiologists speaking to state media say that the new wave is, quote, challenging the coping ability of more inland and small cities, which are not as well equipped as metropolises, and emerging subvariants of Omicron further press antivirus effects as they spread faster and are harder to detect, end quote. However, authorities are learning that developed coastal cities with much better educated and wealthier residents also present their own novel challenges, namely stronger social scrutiny, by PRC standards at least, of local government behaviour. For example, Hong Kong-based South China Morning Post reports yesterday that, after a backlash online, health authorities in the southern megacity of Guangzhou, also known as Canton in English, have apologized for breaking into at least 84 homes after the homeowners had been sent to centralized quarantine facilities. The Post writes that officials in Li Wan district had entered the households earlier this month after breaking the locks to screen for close contacts who may have been hiding out to avoid isolation orders. And last up, the mortgage boycott situation continues to develop this week, though analysts continue to debate just how significant we should be treating it, with some pointing out that there is a real risk of contagion spreading to the banking system and thus sparking a full-blown financial crisis, while others argue that while this risk does exist, the number of mortgages are still too few and Beijing still has financial and political tools in the toolbox which it can employ. Local regulators are now following the central government's lead, rushing to deal with the crisis in an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff move. A number of cities this week have moved to tighten regulation over pre-sale funds to protect the interests of home buyers, including measures for pre-sale funds to be managed in escrow accounts. We remember, however, several months ago, dozens of local governments opened up access to pre-sale funds in order to ease liquidity pressures on developers. 
Now, these mortgage boycotts very much remind us of the systemic nature of a crisis at the scale in which the Evergrande or housing crisis currently is. Any industry representing 20 to 30 percent of the economic activity of a country is of course going to be deeply integrated with most other industries with the rest of the economy. Cash-strapped developers cannot finish apartments, so households are refusing to pay their mortgage payments, putting pressure on banks already challenged on the developer side, concerned that at-risk developers will not be able to pay their bank loans back too. The hit to housing sales has resulted in a drop in demand for land, smashing local government revenue. Bond defaults have badly damaged investor confidence in not just the industry, but other over-leveraged industries too, making financing more expensive, and so on and so on. Taishin Analyst published a great piece this week exploring one of these flow-on issues from the housing crisis, one which we discussed late last year when Evergrande first blew up, and haven't examined too much since, the massive damage to property developer suppliers. Tyson writes that hundreds of landscapers, construction companies, sculpture makers, and other suppliers to China's massive real estate industry have complained that they can no longer afford to pay their bills because some developers, including China Evergrande and others, still owe them money. Quote, the complaints offer a clear example of how the financial problems of China's developers are bleeding into the real economy. The money owed to the suppliers is in the form of commercial paper a kind of IOU that big corporations offer to suppliers in lieu of payment. Typically, commercial paper needs to be repaid within a year. Many analysts regard the debt instrument, which can pay interest and be traded among companies, as issuers of balance sheet debt. End quote. The issue is now that many of these developers are not paying these IOUs. And like the recent mortgage boycotts, this systemic flow-on from the housing crisis is rapidly growing in size. According to China Real Estate Information Corp., the wave of commercial paper defaults by real estate firms has increased risk in at least 20 upstream and downstream industries. China Real Estate Information Corp. also calculates that, by the end of June, there were 1,666 property company projects that missed commercial paper payments at least three times over the previous six months. Of all defaulting insurers, property firms accounted for 62.5% of the defaults of commercial paper last month. And as we can see, the trend is not positive. Quote, In the wake of the high-profile mortgage strike, some suppliers have also refused to repay their bank loans. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.